Hi everyone. This is a really short reminder video and there's three things I want to remind you about. The first is the cardiac cycle. That's important because ultimately what we care about when we're looking at electrophysiology of the heart and reading and ECG tracing is to understand how that impacts either current cardiac output so we make inferences about that cardiac contraction, about filling time, about likely implications for cardiac output, um, and or sometimes it's that we're making inferences about future risk. So sometimes a rhythm in and of itself is not as concerning as what that rhythm could lead to. And so we'll talk about that as we actually do a specific rhythm interpretation and you start to see rhythms that by themselves are less concerning than the risk they pose in that they may lead you into a more lethal rhythm. So let's look at the slide that's on the screen and it's, um, it's a depiction of five different phases that give you insight into the cardiac cycle. So let's start at number one, right at the top, and we see atrial systole. Now I'm going to remind you, and I apologize if um, you're rolling your eyes at me right now. I'm just going to remind you of how we define those terms, systole and diastole. Systole is the active part from a muscular point of view. So that when the muscle is, that heart muscle is contracting, that's that systole. And diastole is that relaxation. So when the muscle is in, in that relaxation phase. So let's look at the top uh, diagram number one in this cycle and we see atrial systole. And so you see in atrial systole, we have blood that has um, uh, moved uh, into, and we'll, we'll get to that um, atrial filling down below, but blood that's moved and filled the atria, both the right and the left atria. When you move, and, and Again, I'm going to talk about it as we move a little further, but before the atria actually contract, we have passive filling of those ventricles. So as the atria are beginning to fill, we already see those ventricles filling as well. So much of the blood that moves into the atria, it's not all, you know, um, gathered up before it moves quickly into the ventricles. A portion of that blood is just passively moving into the ventricles. So we have that passive ventricular filling prior to atrial systole. But in atrial systole, we have that strong contraction of the right atria and the left atria. They have that sort of lickety split one behind the other. I don't care that you know that or not, whether you think they happen exactly at the same moment or one right after the other, it's all fine. We're, what we want, what I want you to understand is that strong contact, contraction of the atria. And I know I've said this a million times, but what that gives you is atrial kick. That 30, when you have a good strong contraction of the atria, 30%, up to 30% of your cardiac output is related to that atrial kick, that good strong contraction of your atria. So in particular, tomorrow when we talk about uh, atrial fibrillation, where the atria is fibrillating, not that good strong contraction, that's where you're gonna see issues um, with that cardiac output. So we, so in atrial systole, that good strong filling, uh, or good strong contraction of your atria and the ventricle, that blood rushes into the ventricles. The next phase is that isovolumetric ventricular contraction. So what we have is those ventricles beginning that filling with blood and as they fill with blood they're moving towards the point where they are going to enter their own um, uh, contraction so it's uh, a filling with blood and then that contraction and that blood is going to move through those um, the the valves that separate the different components and there's two kinds of valves that we worry about or that we pay attention to we've got our um, av valves and the av valves separate the um, right atrium and the right ventricle, the left atrium and the left ventricle. And those valves are the ones that, that they close off when we're about to have that uh, ventricular contraction. And that's because you see how it wouldn't be fruitless if the blood from the ventricles went back up into the atrium. That would be pointless. We need that blood to go out and follow one singular pathway. So those AV valves have closed off so that the blood cannot uh, flow back up into the atria 
And if you remember the AV valves, we have the tricuspid valve, and that is on the right side. That's the right AV valve, has three um, different cusps. And remember, they have those chordae tendinae, which are sort of like an umbrella, if you think of the spokes of an umbrella. And on the left side, we have the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve. And it's bicuspid because it just has um, those two cusps. We also worry about or pay attention to the semilunar valves. Um, and the semilunar valves are actually going to pre uh, prevent backflow of blood. The valves are always preventing that backflow. So they prevent that backflow of blood once it's been ejected in the next cycle uh, back into the ventricles. So once that blood has left the ventricles, those uh, valves close so that the blood does not flow back into the ventricles. So remember, the AV valves prevent blood from flowing back up into the atria. Your uh, semilunar valves prevent blood from flowing back into the ventricles. So in the contraction, that blood is going to uh, be ejected. We've got deoxygenated blood that's going to go into our pulmonary circulation to um, exchange, uh, to go for that gas exchange and to pick up that good oxygen. And we've got um, oxygenated blood from our left ventricle, remember that big muscle over there that's going to go around through, uh, through our generalized body circulation and that blood is going to um, provide oxygen and nutrition to all of our cells in our body. When we look at num uh, number three, that picture number three, we see that ejection happening. So blood is moving out through the, um, the aorta or through the uh, pulmonary circulation to either the lungs or to our generalized body circulation. Uh, diagram number four is going to show you that ventricular relaxation. And remember what's really critical in that relaxation phase is that the um, coronary arteries are actually doing their job of providing nutrition to the heart itself. Remember it gets very, uh, a very small portion of the cardiac cycle is actually set aside for the heart to nourish itself, but it's so essential. And also in that ventricular relaxation phase, we start to see the filling of the um, right and left atrium. So the right and left atria are beginning to fill. Remember, and, and some of that passive filling is gonna begin in a minute, but the right and left uh, atria are, are filling and the coronary circulation is also taking place. The final part of this uh, coronary cycle, or cardiac cycle is that we have passive ventricular filling. So do you remember, even before we have the contraction of the right or left atrium, the blood begins to passively flow into our ventricles. And then we go through the whole cycle again. I hope that's helpful. Okay, conduction. Let's go through this in literally a minute and a half. Here's what I want you to know. Top left side of your diagram, you're gonna see that SA node. Now, do you remember that the heart has very specialized cells that are able to initiate their own electrical impulse? And this is the only place that they exist in the human body. So the SA node is the typical point of origination of our cardiac um, electrophysiological impulse, right? So that, that electric impulse initi initiates in the SA or sinoatrial node, that little orange dot up there on the left side of your screen. That is the most ideal spot for it to initiate. It, it is possible when that is not working well for it to initiate at another point along that pathway. It's also possible that sometimes when there is extra excitability happening for lots of different reasons, chemical exposures, medications, other things that you may, uh, fluid and electrolyte changes, you may see that other cells become highly excitable and begin to jump in ahead of that SA node. So either as a rescue mechanism or because it is a pathology, you may see other cells jump in, but uh, ideally we want the impulse to start right up there at that orange dot, the SA node. The impulse then moves down through that atrium and you see those internodal pathways. And what that means is those are pathways between two nodes, the SA node and then the green dot, the AV node. And the AV node is a collecting place. And that what happens is all of those impulses move along those internodal pathways and they collect up. If you imagine build up steam there for a moment, like a split second right at that AV node. That AV node is right between the atria and the ventricle. And that's what it stands for, atrioventricular node. At that AV node, it builds up steam and then kaboom, that impulse moves down through the ventricles and you see those pathways. So immediately below the AV node, we move into the bundle of Hiss. And 
I, I don't know if any of you have heard of that term bundle branch block. We, what we move into here are the bundle branches. And so they have various names. We're not going to worry about them right now, but we'll see down the left side and the right side of the septum, which separates the left ventricle and the right ventricle, we see those bundle branches. And so the electrical impulse goes from the AV node quickly through that bundle of hiss and then down those bundle branches, and it looks just like a tree, doesn't it? Down those branches, and right along the sides, the bottom and up the sides of our ventricles, and those are our Purkinje fibers, right to the end, which are those Purkinje fibers, which you imagine are sort of like a network. And what we want is that electrical impulse to move along that muscle enough that the entire ventricle, both the left side and the right side, are fully innervated in such a way that they're able to contract, that that muscle receives that electrical impulse and it contracts. So everybody should have right off the top of their memory, SA node, SA node fires at an intrinsic rate, a natural rate of 60 to 100. It moves down through those internodal pathways to the AV node. And you remember that basic principle that we always move down in rate because the lower rate is a rescue rate. It only initiates when a higher order um, in a spot of initiation has, has failed typically. Now that's all things being uh, equal and the heart functioning well. So if the SA node is set to fire at 60 to 100, the AV node in a beautiful, majestic way, that heart is remarkable, is set to fire at 40 to 60. Isn't that amazing? Somewhere in there, uh, the AV node is going to fire. As we move down through the bundle of hiss, we're looking at uh, and those bundle branches, we're looking at 20 to 40. So we move our way down uh, in our natural intrinsic firing rate so that uh, impulses aren't randomly coming in from all over the heart because we wouldn't end up with that, remember that cardiac cycle that requires that the atria first contract. So that electrical impulse goes first through the atria and then it goes through the ventricles. We need that impulse to move in a very um, specific pattern starting in the atrium, moving down through the ventricles. But if for some reason that's not working, our body is designed that there are rescue points all the way through that conduction system. The problem is that sometimes those rescue mechanisms can interfere and can try to take over and be the leader. And we need to balance that. So we'll talk about that as we read the different strips. And now, finally, just a reminder, and typically we see these, sometimes there's uh, things other than medications that cause them, but typically what we're looking at are medication effects when we're gonna talk about three things. A chronotropic effect, which is a change in the actual heart rate. And if it's positive, that means we're increasing the heart rate. If it's negative, it means we're uh, giving a medication to slow down the heart rate. So a chronotropic, if the chron means time, chronotropic effect is a change in the heart rate. An inotropic effect is a change in the contractility, that force of the contraction. And a positive inotropic effect results in an increase in that myocardial contractility. A negative inotropic effect is a decrease in that myocardial contractivity. Where we see this so often is a big category of drugs that we often refer to as inotropes, and those increase the contraction of, the, of uh, that uh, cardiac muscle, and we use those in patients who have a very low uh, blood pressure representing a low cardiac output, and we want to increase that cardiac output. And then finally, what's called a dromotropic effect, and that actually changes the speed of the conduction, and in particular through that AV junction. Do you remember that AV junction is that place where I say it pauses for a split second and just gathers up steam? There are medications that actually can speed that up. Um, there's other conditions that can cause that as well. And again, we sometimes look at fluid and electrolytes and their impact on all of this. But a positive dromotropic effect results in an increase in that uh, velocity of conduction through that AV node. And a negative dromotropic effect is a decrease in the conduction of that impulse through that AV node. Hope that's helpful. See you in class.